The scripture reading for today is taken from the book of Luke. Uh, you can follow along. It's printed in the, in the bulletin this morning. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the world have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. As they stood talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are, your heart, why are you troubled and why do, you, why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. All right. Um, I want to read to you a few um, excerpts from letters that have been written to pastors uh, from children. Um, here's some things they've said. Uh, my father says I should learn the Ten Commandments, but I don't think I want to because we already have enough rules in my house. My mother is very religious. Even if she has a cold, she goes to church every week to play tambola during the service on her phone. Are there any devils on earth? Because I think there may be one in my class. I know God loves everybody, but he never met my sister. Uh, I, I wonder, you know, when we think about the children in our church and uh, our families, what they'll think of God and the gospel and the Bible when they grow up. And when they go out to college, when they go out to uh, school and they meet people who don't believe, I wonder what they're going to think. I wonder what questions they'll ask. I wonder what uh, doubts they'll have. And uh, I wonder how we may be able to answer those doubts if we ourselves uh, don't have certainty, if we ourselves have doubts. So the question I want to ask today is how can you relate to God's word uh, with certainty, not with cynicism? Uh, because we live in a cynical world. We live in a world where everyone's got a Bible. It's not this Bible, but everyone's got a Bible. Because we all put our trust in words. Whatever it is you believe about God's word, uh, you use words to express them. If it's not the words of God, it's the words of a philosopher, and an entertainer, uh, a family, uh, a, a parent, an intellectual, an influencer, but someone. Someone's words are God's words to us. So we all put our confidence in something. And the question I want to ask is, uh, how do we put our trust in God's word uh, more than anybody else's words? And how do we trust God's word with certainty, not with cynicism? And we get three answers from this passage. We can treasure it, we can test it, and we can trust it. Um, uh, we're in, in doing this, we're uh, starting a series in the, the Gospel of Luke. And uh, we, we've already covered a few of these passages in Advent, so it's going to be a little bit non-chronological. But we, I wanted to go back to uh, the beginning of the Gospel of Luke and start. And it's a fascinating beginning. It's a fascinating way in which Luke begins the Gospel. Because if you read what he's saying here, let's, let's just read the four verses uh, that Luke begins with. He says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Uh, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Now the fascinating thing about this is none of this sounds like religion. None of this sounds like mythology or fantasy or fairy tale. It sounds like history. It sounds like someone is reporting on something that has happened. This is not uh, a mythology or fairy tale or fantasy or anything like that. It sounds like history. And uh, I want to focus a little bit on what, uh, the just how much there is in this that is so encouraging to me 
as a Christian because uh, as a Christian it's encouraging for me to know that careful investigation matters. You know, in India it's very easy to tell lies about God and get away with it. But in the gospel, uh, he is, the, 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 the gospel writer is telling us these things matter. And I want to put you into the shoes of, of, the, of, of Luke. Now, a quick poll, just a quick poll. Uh, how many of you have ever had to uh, make, uh, a, make a presentation for someone who's very important and you got very stressed out about it, preparing for it, because it's a pitch or a presentation or someone and stakes are high? How many of you have done that? Okay, quite a few, okay? So you know what Luke is doing. You have felt what Luke is feeling. Because Luke is preparing an orderly account for this person, most excellent Theophilus. Most excellent Theophilus. Theophilus is not a stupid person. Theophilus will not be taken in by, uh, by some fancy narrative. This presentation has to be factual, verifiable. It has to be uh, well presented. The data has to match reality because Theophilus will not be taken in by lies. So Luke is making this incredible presentation and we, we can glean three things from it that we can treasure the gospel, we can uh, test it and we can trust it. So first of all, we can treasure it. Um, it's, it's very important that we see uh, what Luke says here. First, in verse 1, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. That's how the gospel begins. Something has happened. Something has happened. Too much of Christianity today that is projected out is a promise of something that will happen. A lot of New Year's begin like that. Your, your breakthrough is coming. Your miracle is coming. And all of it usually means more money, bigger house, and better things. That's what it means. Luke begins by saying something has happened. Something has, or that's the good news. Something has happened. He begins with that. Then he says this. He says, uh, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. This, word, this phrase, handed down to us, is very important. You know, when I, when I was growing up, I hope it's not too early to talk about the World Cup. I hope it's not too early. But, uh, but uh, I grew up with my father telling me stories of Pele and Maradona. I never watched Pele play. Uh, I watched Maradona play when I was 11 years old, and that was past his prime. I watched the 1990 World Cup, and I was rooting for Brazil. Uh, but the stories I heard from my dad of Pele and Maradona made me fall in love with football. And now, when I grow up, I'm going to have the... I mean, when my kids grow up, I'm going to have the privilege of telling them stories about Messi and Ronaldo and Mbappe and uh, Neymar. I'm going to have the privilege of telling them these stories. Right? Because these stories are uh, handed down. But, it's, but these are just stories, right? But the language here is that something very sick, something about what has happened... Uh, affects everyone. And if you saw the scenes of the celebration in Argentina and the World Cup, they are visible precursors of what's going to happen when Christ himself comes back. These are kind of uh, foretastes of what the world is going to experience when Christ comes back, when he is crowned king. Uh, and these scenes are very important because uh, when something like this happens, it affects a lot of people and you feel the joy as, as if it happened to you. Right. None, of, uh, none of the Argentinians played on the pitch. Uh, it was only 11 people. But because they won, everybody feels like they won. Something happened that affects everyone. Something happened that changes everything, just for them. But this story, this, this, what happened here, is something that happened that changes everything for everyone else around the world, everywhere, across all time. This is completely unique and historical, and that's why it's, it's important. They, they, they treasure it. And they're handed down. This language of handing down is very important. Uh, a, lot of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of us did very strange things during the pandemic. Uh, one of the strange things I did is I got obsessed about watches. And I started watching YouTube videos about expensive watches and uh, all of the complications and all kinds of things. I went, uh, went a little bit crazy. Um, and uh, I remember uh, he hearing about this watch company called Patek Philippe. 
Now, Patek Philippe has a very interesting advertisement slogan. It says, you never actually own a Patek Philippe. You just look after it for the next generation. Because it's a treasure. It's something you hand down. You, you, you preserve it, you protect it, you, because it's precious. And you hand it down to someone, you look after it. It's not gossip, it's not like they say about the Gospels, the gossip, the, the gospel, the Chinese whispers, you know, one person heard one story, another person, they switched it, passing it on from one, one person to another. So what you have here is actually rubbish, we don't know what the original story is. No, no, this language is these people treasured what happened. They took great pains to preserve it and to protect, and they handed it down carefully because it's precious. So Luke is reporting a victory that is much greater than a World Cup victory, that has ramifications much greater uh, than for one nation only. It doesn't just affect Israel, it affects all of us, it changes everything. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a matter of public record, it means that anyone who... Uh, uh, it, it, the significant thing is this, the significant thing is this, um, it means that uh, Christianity is a matter of public record. Right? It's, it's publicly, it's something that happened publicly, it's recorded for public verification, and we belong to a faith that goes back, that is rooted in history. So there's no such thing as, as my, my Christianity or my faith. We are not alone in this. We're not alone in our doubts, in our fears, in our desires, or in our longing to see Jesus and to see him uh, glorified. This, there's a history that goes back all the way to the beginning, and this message that we receive today has been handed down carefully uh, because it's treasured. Now, whenever something is treasured, whenever, the, whenever something is of uh, great quality, uh, there's always imitations. There's always imitations. For every treasure, there's a trinket. For every Rolex, there's a Timex. Where there's this imitation that's much cheaper and diluted. So you have to know, if, even if something is treasured, how can you test it? How can you test it to know what this is the real thing and that's the false thing? And that's what Luke uh, goes to great pains to tell us, that not only do we treasure this, but we can test it. It says uh, in verse 2, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses. This is an extraordinary claim to make to, in this time to someone like Theophilus. That there are eyewitnesses. This is not written uh, 500 years later, 300 years later, 200 years later. This is written within, generation, within a generation of what has happened. Uh, with... with uh, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, listen to this. I have carefully, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Luke is making a compelling, convincing case for an influential person, like all of you have done. But I want you to know, your, your best presentation, can't possibly have had the impact that this presentation has had over generations. This is a presentation that was made so many years ago, and it's well preserved, it's intact, and it's still convincing. It's very, it, the, the important thing is that in a country like India, it, it, is, it is so easy to tell lies about Jesus and get away with it. And it's so difficult to test the truth. Uh, and I want you to know personally, I hate lies. I absolutely hate lies. I hate deception. I hate the smell of lies. I hate a half truth. I hate uh, any, an almost. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. And I'll tell you uh, where some of this comes from. When I was a little child, I was a fasc I was fascinated with WWF wrestling. Uh, and I remember, uh, and we got uh, one show once a week for half an hour that told you what happened last week. One week delay, so we would uh, wait. W we'd watch this show. They don't. They don't show you the match. It's just the highlights and the results. So I was obsessed with that. And I remember this great WrestleMania or some magical thing was going to happen, and we were waiting for this big matchup between these two wrestlers. And it was the Friday, and uh, which means the uh, the we would get the results next week. And I met this guy Saturday morning. This kid at a wedding. 
says, I saw the match last night. I know who won. And he's telling me who won. I'm like, no, this is just, not, this doesn't sound right. How can you know? Nobody knows. We don't know. We'll find, we'll find out on Friday. And he came, no, no, I know. I saw the match. And I'm like, this, this, and I'm so frustrated. This, this, you're lying to me. This is not true. This can't be true. But there's no way to prove it. There's no way to prove it. Maybe he's telling the truth. Maybe he is. Maybe he did so. But how did he, how could it? And he insisted and he insisted. And I've been through many t times like this when I was a kid. And from that point, uh, I mean, not, maybe not from that point on, but for this and other incidents like this, uh, you realize uh, there are some lies that can't be tested. There are some lies that can't be tested. And I want you to know the gospel isn't like that. The Bible isn't like that. This is truth that was tested and it can still be tested. And you need to know the most tested things are the most trusted things. Until something is tested, you can't trust it. You do it every time you buy something on Amazon. You go to the reviews, you listen to people, you figure out what, 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 can I, what, can, what has been most tested that I can trust. And Luke is telling us right here in the beginning of the gospel, I've tested this. And how important this is, because in India, you know, I could tell you a story like last night I had a dream. Um, I woke up in the middle of the night, my soul ascended out of my body. I went through the ceiling of, of my house, went up, was lifted up into the heavens. Uh, the glory of the Lord Jesus shone upon me. He was dressed in gold. And when he opened his mouth, the purple flower came out of his mouth. And the purple flower turned into a mountain of purple flowers. And out of the purple flowers came some goats. And the goats went this way and suddenly there was some sheep and the sheep disappeared. And one sheep came to me and said, Jesus is your good shepherd. Prove me wrong. It's so sad that in India, there are audiences I could tell this story to. And they would believe me. I could sell that here for money. You know why people believe lies like that? Because they're scared. We're scared in India. We're lonely. We're anxious. We need to believe that there's someone strong, someone big, someone powerful, who can do great things for us. But the gospel is is that there is someone like that, but he's already done the great thing. He's already done it. And it can be tested. Now, I know that the, I, I could have spent some time in this sermon uh, giving you the reasons why the gospel can be tested and the gospel can be trusted. I don't want to do that for, for two reasons. Uh, one is this is a lot. There's just so much. There's an embarrassment of riches for the evidence for the New Testament. It's embarrassing. If you're a Christian, and you know that. But I will tell you a story. When I was 17, uh, this question mattered to me. It mattered to me because my father's an evangelist. He's been uh, a Christian for a long time. Uh, and I was at that age where I realized I, have, I believe something about Jesus that most people don't. My, my classmates don't. They do. So I, I need to figure out what is it about uh, this thing that has captivated my father. And either my father is insane or there's some truth to this. So I had to, do, I had to carefully investigate scripture. I listened to uh, uh, a whole lot of, we had audio tapes in those days. Uh, there was a library next door. I listened to all these audio tapes. And I remember the first time I heard evidence for the resurrection. And there was, there was something in me that just rejoiced because it, it, it showed me that it mattered to God that careful investigation, sorry, it, it matters that careful investigation uh, means something to God. God loves us too much to give us something and tell us, uh, I've just told you, don't think. It's just, I, I've just told you, why are you asking me questions? No, he says, come, carefully investigate, test it. And you can, and you can test it. That's the beauty of the gospel. Uh, I love that the truth can be tested. 
I love that the fact I love the fact that the gospel is something that can invite scrutiny. Come read the gospels. Come check the history. Come look at every look at these arguments because we have an embarrassment of riches. Uh, and I love that that's important. Now I also want to recognize that uh, psychology will tell you something about human beings because when you made that pitch to that client, remember that when you made that pitch, you may have had the best presentation with all of the right arguments, all of the data uh, fits everything, and the client may still have said no, no not convinced and you know the data is true you know you, you what you're doing is best for this person and they still say no that's because human psychology tells us people uh, don't believe what they don't want to believe people don't believe what they don't want to believe and we must recognize that about scripture and one thing i want to commit to you as a church we always want to uh, bring teaching to you that can be tested. Robust biblical theology that can be tested. Uh, because there's, there's this famous story of a US president who read the Bible and decided that he was going to uh, cut out of the Bible literally all the things that he didn't agree with. So he took a pair of scissors, took a Bible and started cutting all the pieces that he didn't agree with or didn't like. And in many ways, we, uh, we live in a time where people do that. Like, I like this part of the Bible, I like this part of Jesus, I like this, but all this stuff I don't like, I'm going to cut it out. And I want you to know, like, you know that game Rock, Paper, Scissors, where uh, between paper and scissors, the scissors always wins, right? But I want, to, I want to commit to you as a church, as a church, when it comes to paper, scissors here, paper always wins. Paper will always win. We won't cut anything out. And we want to commit to you, we might, we, we, it means we'll have to teach things from scripture that you may not like, that may offend you, that may hurt your feelings. But what would we be if we chose the Bible that we want? We would essentially be saying, my word is God's word. What we want to say to you in this church, God's word is God's word. Uh, so Luke carefully investigates, and look at everything from the beginning. I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Now finally, uh, we can trust it. We can treasure it, we can test it, and we can trust it. Verse 4, uh, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Uh, we live in a world where Certainty is a bad word. Cynicism is okay. Skepticism is okay. You can always be questioning, but you can never find an answer. You can always be seeking, but you must never find what you're looking for. You may always be on a journey, but never arrive at the destination. Because if you say you have the answer, if you say, I know for sure, then you're arrogant, or you're proud, or you're self-centered. And I want you to know, it, it is possible that that can happen. Right? But Luke's uh, de desire for, for Theophilus and for all of us is to know the certainty of the things we have been taught. And the certainty is, is, the, is that Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen from the dead. I remember reading this uh, uh, book by Peter Thiel, uh, called Zero to One, in which uh, he begins by uh, telling, uh, say, saying, asking people, uh, 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 he has a common question he asks people, and he says, tell me something that you believe that most people don't believe. And when I read that, the, my answer was immediate. I believe that Jesus is risen from the dead, actually, physically, in history. Most people don't believe that. But what, what Luke is calling for us to believe is to recognize uh, why this matters. Okay, now I want to take you to the end of Luke because there he gives, Jesus himself gives you uh, a picture of what it is that Luke is talking about. What are these things that have been accomplished? Uh, what are the things uh, about which Luke wants certainty? So verse 25, Jesus who is risen from the dead says this to his disciples. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. 
Now let's pause for a minute and recognize that the Christianity is not the invention of the early church. It's rooted in Old Testament history. That's another thing that can be tested. And Jesus is saying this entire Old Testament history, all these events that have happened, they're all about me. They're all about me. And verse 36, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. See how many times Jesus is saying, see. See my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. It's incredible. And this is the hope of the Christian, that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. So I want to tell you why certainty in, in Jesus actually brings humility. When you're certain about something, you might say to them, you're wrong, I'm right. You're wrong, I'm right. But certainty in Jesus begins by recognizing, I was wrong. I have been made right. I have received rightness. Everything in me that I brought to God was wrong. We begin with wrongness. We receive rightness. That's why Jesus died. Because he di lives the life that we could not live. He died the death that we should have died. And he is risen from the dead as a foretaste of the promise. One day we too will rise from the dead. That's the certainty we have. That's the certainty we have. That's the certainty Luke wants you, to, wants you to have. And our certainty is always shaken up by how we feel or the situations that we're in. Those are the things that usually shake our certainty. What we're feeling or the situations that we're in. But I want you to know, history doesn't care about that. History doesn't care about your feelings. History doesn't care about your situations because this thing happened. And that's why we have to train our hearts, whatever we're feeling, to remind ourselves, whatever I'm feeling, whatever I'm going through, this thing remains that Jesus died for me and he is risen from the dead. And if that is true, then it is the death of cynicism. It is the death of skepticism. And we have to align our hearts and our minds. That's why it's so interesting. Jesus asked the question, why do, di why do doubts arise in your hearts? Now, it, you, you, you assume the doubts are in your minds. But Jesus is asking the question, why do doubts arise in your hearts? Because he knows if you have certainty in your heart that I am risen, then your mind will follow. Your mind will follow what your heart knows. So this Sunday morning, I want to invite you to receive the certainty that God offers in Christ. That He is risen. And no matter what you're feeling, no matter what you're going through, you may not get resolution to what you're feeling, you may not get resolution to, to your situation, but this thing you can know. That Christ is risen from the dead. He died the death. Uh, we should have died. And He is risen from the dead means one day we will rise from the dead. Um, let me close with this. There's a, there's a book I was reading in preparation for this. It's a short book called Seven Reasons You Should Reconsider Christianity. And it's a simple book. It gets through, uh, if for anyone who has questions about what, what, what does the test look like, what is the historical evidence, you go to that book and I could, uh, you can ask me about it, I can tell you more about it. Uh, but I was a little bit uh, taken aback by how the book ends. Uh, because this is written by a man named Ben Shaw, and at the end of this book, spoiler alert, sorry, but at the end of the book he tells us that uh, he has cancer. Uh, he has cancer and uh, he's, so for him, this is no longer abstract, academic, theological work. He has to personally wrestle with the fact, uh, with the question of whether he believes that Jesus is risen from the dead. It has to go to his heart now. 
And uh, there's another uh, uh, personal hero of mine, Tim Keller, a couple of years ago, uh, he wrote an article about how he had uh, in, the, in the Atlantic, of how um, uh, a couple of years ago he was diagnosed with, with, diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, the thing that took Steve Jobs. Uh, now he's got pancreatic cancer, and he wrote a similar article saying the same thing. After many years of preaching that Christ is risen, I now have to face the reality of whether I believe it. And how deeply do I believe it? And uh, Ben Shaw, in his book, uh, he, he writes, and uh, so I, as soon as I read the book, the book doesn't uh, tell you what happened, so I googled it. I googled what happened to Ben Shaw, and he died. Last year, he died. And part of me is heartbroken because, uh, you know, we've lost someone like Ben Shaw, but part of me realizes, you know, now he's seen with his own eyes the thing he saw with eyes of faith. What he was certain about here has been validated. He is now enjoying the embrace of his Savior. And I want you to know, if you have certainty like that, you can get through anything. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your word, Lord. We want to thank you that it defies all our expectations and undermines all our biases. Your word is true and good and beautiful. And we want to thank you for your son, Lord, who is the embodiment of your word. We want to thank you for the gift of your Son and the extent you would, to which you have gone to show us that you love us. We want to thank you, Lord, for uh, the gift of this community in which we get to enjoy your word together and support one another and hold one another, hold one another up when we're down and encourage one another and serve one another according to your word. And Lord, we ask you, Lord, that you will truly in our hearts give us this uh, sense, that we, uh, give us this uh, uh, confidence, Lord, to trust your word and to treasure it. And I pray, Lord, that just as Luke is testifying to Theophilus, that we would also, because we trust your word, because we have tested it, because we tre treasure it, we would also testify to all of the Theophiluses in our lives. We ask, Lord, that you would give us courage, that you would give us opportunity, and you would give us confidence uh, to be living witnesses who are certain about the things that happened and rejoice in the goodness of it. We ask all these things in Jesus' name.